Hello and welcome. And um, this is an event on decolonizing Wikipedia and London's colonial her stroke histories, hosted by the University of the Arts London, London College of Communication. Today is Tuesday, the 2nd of November, and this is a public panel discussion event. And um, those of you joining us in the audience are very welcome. Um, I'm going to start with some introductions to the event and myself. Um, so my name is Lucy Panasar. I'm a project manager at the London College of Communication, and I am the Wikimedian in residence for the University of the Arts London. This particular project um, for which this event is the first um, for the 2021-2022 academic year, um, as mentioned before, is for a project entitled Decolonising Wikipedia, London Colonial Her Stroke Histories. And this is the first of three events for this academic year. Um, this evening's event is very much a, a launch, kind of launching into the notion of decolonising Wikipedia in relation to London's colonial histories. Um, I've already scheduled two other events for the year. In February, we'll be having a second event that will continue, hopefully, some of the discussion that we are starting this evening. And on the 10th of May, it will be kind of culminating the, the year's work, reflecting, taking stock and thinking about what the next steps might be. Each of these events are being hosted online um, in Zoom webinar. Um, this is a, a particular kind of Zoom, which enables us as the panelists to use our cameras and microphones, but not those of you in the audience, um, due to the numbers being quite big. But we really do welcome some comments, questions, responses from the audience using the Q&A tool, which I'll be coming back to towards the end of this evening's panel. Each of these events are being recorded and will go on to the LCC YouTube channel afterwards. So if you need to drop out or if you know someone else who might be interested to watch, you know you can come back and, and watch again later. Oh, still just getting used to advancing my slides. So I um, am running this project um, as part of the University of the Arts London's knowledge exchange work. And it aligns to the a relatively new strategy that the university has for knowledge exchange, which involves a whole host of different kind of um, sort of objectives and aspirations um, to do with empowering people to make change, to use creativity and enhance creativity for, for kind of social good, to be innovative, collaborative, to inspire creative change, to, to co-create better places. So knowledge exchange really is about exchange, collaboration, um, working within the university and without, so beyond the university walls and forming lasting relationships um, that can help to um, yeah, enhance the way that we produce and um, disseminate knowledge. And that's what's supporting the work that um, we're, we're speaking about this evening. And it's with UAL Knowledge Exchange funding that I've been seconded on Fridays through the next academic year to be UAL's Wikimedian in residence. So working directly with Wikimedia UK uh, with the explicit aims to develop an understanding of the role that Wikipedia can play in decolonization, to expand the existing decolonizing Wikipedia network across UAL. For the last year, it was exclusive to just one of our colleges, LCC. But for this year, we're seeing the expansion of that across the, the six colleges of the university. And lastly, to continue to prompt and support people to edit and create Wikipedia pages, um, but ones in particular that relate to London's colonial, her stories, histories, and the legacies of that, that, those histories. I've put an asterisk there next to the word decolonization and decolonizing, because this isn't a term that's without contestation. It's a term that has multiple definitions, um, interpretations that um, I could go into and do a whole seminar on, on that in itself. For the purpose of this evening's event, I'll refer to the the statement that we have on the Decolonising Wikipedia Network's homepage, which says that decolonization is not a metaphor or a synonym for diversity and inclusion work. 
So we're citing here a very important piece of um, writing by Tuck and Yang in 2012. Instead, decolonization is about equity, justice and reparation for those whose lives and life chances have been and continue to be negatively affected by colonization. Under British colonial rule, entire communities and nations suffered the loss or oppression of traditional knowledge and ways of knowing and other forms of epistemicide, which is a fancy way of saying the destruction or killing of knowledge. The legacy of this continues to influence knowledge, production and dissemination to this day. So that's a statement that we've got on the network homepage. And it's my aim as the Wikimedian in residence at UAL and the lead of this network at UAL to support UAL students and staff and members of the local community to play an active role in the decolonization of knowledge through editing Wikipedia. Whilst also co-editing selected Wikipedia pages myself. So it's between March and May this year, I worked with an LCC photojournalism student, Lydia Wilkes to co-edit the Wikipedia page for the 1911 Festival of Empire, which is an event that took place in Crystal Palace Park. And you'll find on YouTube a whole other roundtable discussion about this particular event from earlier this year that I created. But just to say a little bit about what we did here for the Wikipedia edit, is that we added to the page um, more information that we'd found from various sources about the festival design, its contents, so quite descriptive um, information and some imagery that we'd managed to acquire courtesy of the Crystal Palace Museum. And we also added some context surrounding the event and critical appraisal that the event received, citing different scholars and sources. When we first arrived at this Wikipedia page, it looked like there was just so much that was absent um, in telling the story of this example of colonial history in London. So we set out to try to add more of that information. And in doing so, we kind of realized there was even more information to discover that could kind of serve a, a kind of long-term project. So over the summer, I thought, I'd like to do this again in collaboration with others and to see what other interpretations and perspectives may bring to editing this, or a continuation of the editing of this Wikipedia page. And I applied for some heritage lottery funding to work between Wikimedia UK and the South London Gallery who host a, a youth group called the Art Assassins. And I applied for this funding so that the investigation of the 1911 festival could be continued by that youth group, the Art Assassins, and that for that kind of investigation to continue to influence further edits of not only Wikipedia pages, but Wikicommons, Wikidata, and other aspects of the Wikipedia and um, Wikimedia projects. So this is, as I said, it's Heritage Lottery funded, supported by the um, Department of Culture and Media and Support, and it's being administrated by the Audience Agency. So it's really great to see this kind of running now from between now and March 2022. Um, and the project is called Places Never Seen, a youth-led digital exploration of the 1911 Festival of Empire. And I've already invited them to speak at one of the future events. So watch this space and hopefully you can see some examples of how that develops. But back to this evening, I've invited to speak this evening um, four speakers who are gonna help us to think about this kind of combination of Wikipedia and decolonizing Wikipedia or with, with that intention. And also London's, I've put here, he in, in brackets, because it's not just about history, it's about stories, you know, whose narratives, whose stories, whose backgrounds, whose lives are within this city and reflected in its physical and online presence today. So this is what I'm aiming for with this evening's panelists. Um, and then we'll be leading into some discussion at the end to think about this kind of combination. 
So first up, in a moment, I'll be handing over to Alex Goodall, who is a student at the London College of Communication and has been a very active member of the Decolonising Wikipedia network with me over the last year, really key in setting that up. Um, so he's going to be speaking a little bit about his experience and a particular example of editing. Richard Neville from Wikimedia UK is going to be speaking about what decolonisation means for Wikimedia UK and the work that we've been doing um, as partners. We've then got two guest speakers, Iqbal Singh from the National Archives, will be speaking about a particular example of archival material that relates back to the period of, of colonial rule in Britain, but offering us a kind of different view of that, kind of anti-colonial perspective that's reflected in the archives. And then finally, from the Mayor of London's office, um, Sarah Dos Santos and Kirsten Dunn will be speaking to us about a relatively new piece of work um, it's being led by the Mayor of London's office on diversity in the public realm and kind of I'm really interested to kind of for us to think about how that relates in the physical sense of the public realm but also Wikipedia as a site of public um, information and intervention. So I think that's it for in terms of my introduction as I said we really welcome questions, comments to come in via the Q&A. Um, I'm controlling the slides this evening. You're going to be hearing our speakers saying next slide. slide. <laughs> um, as I'm controlling that and I'll be coming to those questions intermittently just to kind of see what kind of things are coming in and I'll be offering the, the panellists to, to speak about those towards the end. Okay, so without further to do, I think I hand over to you, Alex. Thanks, Lucy, and hi, everyone. Um, so like Lucy said, um, I'm a student um, at LCC. I'm studying sound arts. Um, and I think about this time last year, if I'm not mistaken, it was last November when we set up um, the Decolonising Wikipedia Network. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what that is, why we did it, um, and why it's, why it's still going, why it's important. Uh, so next slide, please. So I guess the first and major question is why Wikipedia? Um, why focus our attention on this ephemeral <laughs> uh, entity which pervades so much of the internet? Um, I, I, as you probably know, Wikipedia is a global resource. It's read 20 billion times a month, roughly. Um, and for that reason, visibility on Wikipedia translates to visibility online as a whole. Wikipedia is used by Amazon and Google to power their personal assistants, and it's used by YouTube and Facebook to combat fake news and conspiracy theories. It's used by the public and professionals. For example, journalists use Wikipedia to brush up on subjects and decide who to talk to. Wikipedia, for these reasons, is essentially the backbone of the internet, and it aims to be neutral. But it's important to remember that while, for, despite all this, Wikipedia is edited and maintained by a vast user base, for the most part, it's trustworthy if you follow through with citations, but there are a lot of potential reasons for biases on Wikipedia. Since it reflects the world, marginalized groups are often not well presented. It's worth noting, for example, that writers on Wikipedia are mostly from Europe and North America. Only about 10% of Wikipedia's writers are women, and only about 18% of biographies on English Wikipedia are about women. In terms of uh, barriers for access as well, um, access to tech and digital poverty prevent um, the participation of certain groups and pervasiveness of English as dominant in online spaces can also present barriers. Since Wikipedia is such a renowned and widely used platform, we believe it's essential that these biases are addressed. Through editing and creating pages with decolonial thoughts at the heart of the process, we believe that positive and long-lasting change can be made to knowledge production. So that's the brief kind of answer to why Wikipedia. Um, next slide, please, Lucy. So when we set up the network, we set up, um, we kind of defined our aims. And they have uh, changed a little bit, uh, which I'll talk about. Um, so the first one is to increase the visibility and credibility of underrepresented and marginalized figures and topics connected to our subject disciplines. 
It's interesting to note that this originally alluded more to arts practitioners rather than figures and topics. I think what we realized as a group quite early on is that so much of what we do in an arts context is informed not just by practitioners, but by topics, by the places we live, by the, uh, the, uh, the figures around us. Um, and it's important to address those things at the root rather than just the bits that directly pertain to us. So we brought in this out and I think that led to, uh, for example, the work on Festival of Empire led by Lucy and Lydia. Um, it was in, important for us, I think, as a network to realize that and to broaden out our scope. We also aim to support students and staff to become Wikipedia editors and creators with anti-racism and decolonization at the heart of our efforts and to create opportunities for students to play active roles in decolonizing knowledge while improving research, writing and editing skills, as Lucy has already alluded to with her secondment. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if we go to the next slide, please, um, I'll just talk briefly about, I think, my favorite edit. And I like this one because it's very small. I think it's important to think about editing Wikipedia, not as some huge overhaul of the entire internet, but as little interventions that are important in terms of making sure that people aren't left out of stories in history. Um, so a little bit of context, there was a law in New York City called the Cabaret Law, which prevented dancing in bars after a certain uh, time in the evening. Um, and the original, when I first accessed the Wikipedia page for this law, um, the repeal was mentioned purely in this kind of, um, in this very dry way, which didn't really allude to the story of why it was revealed. Um, and I happen to know a little bit about this because of a talk that I'd attended um, as part of LCC the previous year. And I thought it was important to recognize the work of um, an incredible black woman called Frankie Hutchinson um, of Disc Woman. Um, she's an, an amazing DJ and she um, set up and led the Dance Liberation Network um, and the Let New York City Dance Movement which campaigned for the repeal of the law. And they were successful, they did it. And I think this is a good example of how just small interventions in stories and in the things that are important to us online can really benefit the way that we think about our histories um, and the way that we appreciate the work of other people. So yeah, I think that's everything I have to say about my time doing um, Wikipedia work. I'll hand over to Richard Neville now of Wikimedia UK. Thank you very much, Alex. Some really good points made there. Um, so I'm going to start by explaining what Wikimedia UK is, what we do, and how important decolonization is for Wikipedia. So Wikimedia UK is a UK-based charity, and we help organisations, universities, libraries, museums and archives work with Wikipedia. So it can be helping people become more critical readers or it can help them learn the skills to engage with Wikipedia to actually add information and share their knowledge and skills online. And I think Wikipedia needs to assess its role in um, decolonizing information. Because it is so influential in how information is shared, um, we need to make sure that Wikipedia is representative of the world around us. And that can be a challenge because there are certain groups who are much more prominent online and have much easier access to information. So Wikipedia doesn't end up telling the whole story. This image you see here shows all the geomapped points on Wikidata. It's one of Wikipedia's sister sites. As you can see, North America and Europe are lit up. And that kind of reflects the state of knowledge around Wikipedia and its sister sites. It is a very North American and European website. And the way this feeds through into content is that you often find subjects which should be global in nature, placing more emphasis on these regions. Um, you might find that the images will be primarily from Europe and North America. And you will also sometimes find um, 
out of context source material used to write Wikipedia articles. So there have been studies which have found that um, indigenous art is usually written by people on Wikipedia, written about by people not from those cultures. And so it's this colonization effect of knowledge online. And so it's important that organizations like Wikimedia UK and our parent organization in the US, the Wikimedia Foundation, it's important that we actively engage with groups who are involved in decolonial practices and bringing this knowledge online and involving these groups in that knowledge production. It would be inappropriate to force all the work onto those groups. Um, groups who may uh, be marginalized for many different reasons and not necessarily have the time with which to engage on Wikipedia. And equally, we can't solve it all ourselves. Um, that would simply compound the current problem of European and American people writing about the entire world. There are many different ways in which this can be addressed. If we, I mean, one of them is involving uh, various community groups around this knowledge production. We can also look at what the sources we use to produce this material actually are. Are they produced by people who have engaged with these communities? Are they from these communities? Um, have they been critically involved with them? Um, if not, if it is that purely outside of you, is there a better source we can be using for this information? And this is something which Wikipedia, it's kind of on this path, working out how to progress to a decolonized state of information. Because Wikipedia aspires to be neutral in its content. Um, but I would argue that it's huge imbalances on a large scale means it's not neutral. But the great thing about Wikipedia is that it can be changed. We have the power and the ability to go in and fix those problems. I'm not going to say we're going to fix colonization overnight just by editing Wikipedia, but we can make some progress through Wikipedia and through the world around us. And that's really important because since Wikipedia relies on external sources for its information, it can sometimes lag behind where the current state of discourse is around a particular subject. For example, the British Museum has a collection of ancient Greek marbles taken from Greece in the 19th century. They are known as the Parthenon marbles, but you might recognize them better as the Elgin marbles. The British Museum website refers to them now as the Parthenon marbles. This change came about a couple of years ago, as far as I can tell, and doesn't seem to be particularly heralded at the time. It was kind of, it happened and that's that. But Wikipedia still refers to them as the Elgin marbles. And that's partly because Wikipedia's reliance on external sourcing means that it follows the majority view sometimes, even if that view is now outdated. And so Wikipedia has its potential to ossify knowledge at a particular point in time. And so we do need to go in and challenge the knowledge within Wikipedia, examine if it has moved on since. And so that's part of the process of decolonization. Lucy, could we have the next slide, please? And because Wikipedia, as Alex said, reflects the world around us, it is imperfect. But we have that opportunity to do something about it. And it can be difficult to demonstrate clearly what the impact of that is. But it's safe to say that there will be an impact because people go to Wikipedia on a regular basis. And whether that's helping people better understand the subjects or become engaged with understanding what decolonization is, or just changing the way in which they refer to terms so they're no longer using um, loaded language um, with the weight of colonization behind it. That's a valuable thing we can be doing. 
And this kind of thing will go through many, many different kinds of articles. The English Wikipedia has six million entries. There are going to be huge numbers of pages which need to be looked at for where the knowledge is coming from, how it's presented, which voices are coming through, and how it's illustrated as well. So it really is quite a large scale project, but the great thing is you can pick whatever scale you engage with. And writing Wikipedia, by bringing through new voices, we're writing people back into history. So the great thing about Alex's uh, work involving uh, this woman was that he was able to actually highlight the people involved in that process. And that's really important because Wikipedia is the forefront of so many people's search for information. If that isn't at people's fingertips, it, people effectively get written out of the record. So yes, those names will be in the news articles, in the journal articles, in the books written about the topic. But so many people won't dig that bit deeper. They will skate along the top of the knowledge and that will by and large be Wikipedia and Google. So it's so important to have this information prominent and widely available. And so at Wikimedia UK, we've been taking our first few steps on this over the last couple of years and working out how we actually do this. Um, and it's really been kicked along by the uh, decolonizing Wikipedia network, which we are currently a part of. And as part of that, next slide please, Lucy. We were delighted to recognize this year the decolonizing Wikipedia network as our partnership of the year. It's a great initiative um, tackling what can be quite a charged area, but one which is so vital to Wikipedia's um, ongoing pursuit for knowledge and relevance within society. Wikipedia has a potential to be the great social good and projects like this are an invaluable part of that. And that concludes my part about how important this is for Wikipedia and for Wikimedia UK. Thank you so much, Richard and Alex, um, for that fantastic overview of, of, of the efforts that we are going to um, in, in decolonising Wikipedia for the last year up to this point. That's really fantastic. Thank you. So I think now we're kind of moving into the sort of the other area of, of the project, which is thinking more about London um, its histories, its stories, the narratives, um, past, present um, evidence and kind of future. You know, how can we influence and shape um, that, that landscape? Um, whether through Wikipedia or other efforts. So I'm going to now hand over to our, our two guest speakers, the first of which um, Iqbal Singh, if you'd like to come on. Uh, thank you, Lucy. So just to introduce myself, my name is Iqbal Singh and I work at the National Archives and the National Archives are the archives of the British government. And I'm part of the outreach team, which I joined in 2015. And I've been developing projects with a particular focus on using our records to address issues of racism, colonialism and empire. Earlier this year, I presented online with British Museum on a series of collaborative projects I have led that explore the use of therapeutic practice and archival research to explore 20th century black British history and the history of Indian indenture. And I've also now been developing a project in collaboration with Tamasha Theatre Company to explore the role of drama in widening and deepening our understanding of the past. The latest iteration of this collaboration is a new short audio play, and I'd strongly recommend you to come and listen. It's called A Stranger in a Strange Place. It's on the repatriation of people from the British West Indies in the 1920s in Liverpool, and it will premiere online on Thursday, 18th November at 7 p.m., and details can be found on Eventbrite. And just finally on this slide, um, I'm also currently taking part. I'm a history PhD program candidate at King's College London and my research is looking at racism and empire in the interwar years. If you can go to the next slide Lucy. So the history I want to share with you today focuses on one of the documents in the National Archives collection. 
In May 1921, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote to Winston Churchill, then Secretary for the Colonies, requesting help and encouragement with the London part of the Pan-African Congress. Du Bois wrote, I'm asking, or I'm writing to ask, I should say, if we could arrange in some way to receive from your office some help and encouragement. I should like best to have a representative of the British colonial offices to speak to our Congress and to state in some general terms the main ideas of Great Britain toward her Negro subjects, civilized and uncivilized. If this would not be feasible, perhaps you might suggest some other way in which you would be willing to help. You know, the next slide, Lucy. So this is the letter in the collection. Um, his letter in our collection is typed on special brown headed paper of the crisis newspaper, which Du Bois edited. It was the newspaper of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which Du Bois had also helped found. The choice of the term colored brought into focus the plight not only of black Americans and their struggles against segregation and racism, but also a wider range of peoples in Africa and elsewhere, including Asia, struggling against European imperialism and domination. It is a short letter, about one and a half pages long. It is businesslike, opening with a mention of the first Pan-African Congress in Paris in 1919. It then sets out the intention to hold three parts to the second Pan-African Congress in 1921, starting in London on the 28th and 29th of August. In the letter, Du Bois states that he would like the Colonial Office to send a representative to the Congress to help inform those attending about how Britain intends to address matters of freedom and self-determination for its non-white subjects. And for me, I mean, I came across this Du Bois letter by, by chance when I was researching the fallout from the 1919 race riots in Britain. The letter is hidden away in a large collection of correspondence in, our, in one of our many Colonial Office files. So in amongst correspondence and reports dealing with the tsetse flies and venereal disease and the conditions of Indians in Fiji and East Africa and the proposed relief for destitute colored seamen is this letter from Du Bois. Just move on to the next image. To say a little bit about Du Bois, so William Edward Burhart Du Bois, often referred to as W.E.B. Du Bois, is known for his writings. Uh, he wrote in various genres, including poetry, novels, journalism, scholarly monographs, and autobiographies. He was the first African-American to earn a PhD from Harvard University in 1895. Du Bois also helped found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, which published the crisis newspaper. So you can see that also on the slide, a front cover. Some of his works have become celebrated texts, often reflecting philosophically on the Black experience in the US. His writing includes concepts such as double consciousness, where he reflects on what it is to be both American and Black. Move on to the next slide. So I'm just going to take you through a little bit of the detail. Du Bois had, along with others, been part of a growing Pan-African movement that saw the centrality of Africa in history and its centrality in contemporary politics and economics. Du Bois was increasingly concerned that Germany's imperial ambitions and during the First World War saw it as more dangerous for colonized people than even Britain and France. At the end of the war, his concern was how the victorious powers would manage the peace, particularly in terms of Africa. Du Bois found an ally in the French Senegalese politician, Blaise Giang, and together they organized the first Pan-African Congress in Paris in February, 1919. Later, reflecting on his experience in Paris, Du Bois said he became aware of the real need to address the gap between colonial powers and those they ruled. It made him redouble his efforts to hold a Pan-African Congress in 1921, including one in London. Just move to the next slide. London, as you, you will know, was the beating heart of the British Empire. It was also the seat of the British government. London was also a hub that linked into black and anti-colonial struggle. Despite the evident enthusiasm with which he wrote to Churchill, who was then the colonial secretary, the colonial office charged with responding to Du Bois's request to host a Pan-African Congress in London, struck an altogether less enthusiastic tone, privately saying it was best to decline the invitation to send a speaker, saying they were currently too busy. The comments from the officials indicate that at this stage, the Congress was seen as something to be wary of and not something to be taken too seriously. The reply that was drafted by Gilbert Grindle, one of the officials, said, that with regret, it would not be possible to arrange for a colonial office representative to attend. 
Interestingly, further correspondence in the National Archives collection from August 1921 includes a note from the British Embassy in the US with more information about Du Bois, suggesting that there remained an interest in the London Congress, even if no one from the colonial office had time to attend. Just move on to the next slide. So London Congress itself, which I know is one of the focuses that Lucy's spoken about at the opening of this um, today's session, this Congress in London was able to gather a significant interest, including from figures of Black African heritage in Britain at the time. And I think this is important to now recognize this point about London's rich colonial history, as it were. The first day was on 27th August, 1921. So nearly, well, just over hundred years ago in Central Hall in London. A description of the delegates indicates that people from very diverse backgrounds attended. In attendance at the Congress, were black British representatives, including the former mayor of Battersea and the first black person to hold this office, John Archer. And Archer led the second day's proceedings with Du Bois. The first day was co-led by the British-based Dr. Al Sindor, who along with John Archer was involved in the African Progress Union, an organization founded in London, which campaigned for black people's rights across the world. Also in attendance, and reflecting the diversity of the Congress was the future Indian Communist MP for Battersea, Shapurji Sapatwala. In addition to those from Britain, the, Southern, the London Pan-African Congress had representatives from South Africa, the Gold Coast, Sierra Leone and Lagos, Grenada, the USA, Martinique, Liberia, British Guyana, Jamaica, and people of African heritage living in London. Just move to the next slide, please. The outcome of the Congress was far less militant in tone than may have been expected. It appealed for far greater fairness, inclusion and education and opportunities for self-development. And Du Bois writing in his regular column for the crisis newspaper for the November 1921 edition reported on the Pan-African Congress with the following plea. The absolute equality of races, physical, political and social is the founding stone of world peace and human advancement. No one denies great differences of gift, capacity and attainment among individuals of all races but the voice of science, religion, and practical politics is one in denying the God-appointed existence of super races or of races naturally and inevitably and eternally inferior. So the resolutions emanating from the Congress called for an investigation into the exploitation of black and colonial labor. It also called for a greater focus on self-government for the colonies, and finally, that all people should be treated in a civilized manner. Reflecting on the Congress later, Du Bois recognized that its impacts may have been muted, coming as it did straight after the momentous events of the First World War. Du Bois also felt that timing-wise, the Congress was affected by the reputation of the outspoken Pan-African nationalist leader, Marcus Garvey, and his radical movement, which meant that what Du Bois was doing was also treated with suspicion. And just to the final slide, Du Bois's writings are what many consider heroic, in particular his powerful ability to reflect on and express the experience of black and colonized people and their struggle to prove their humanity, secure better rights and ultimately gain freedom and equality. His famous observation, which is on the screen there, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, itself inspired by a Frederick Douglass essay of the same title, sets out what became a key guide to his campaign for racial justice and equality. It is important to note, Du Bois was also of his time, born and raised in the Victorian era. At the time of the second Pan-African Congress in London, his language and views on race and gender, for example, would from today's vantage point appear strange at times, but the sentiment in his writing and his activism ultimately reflect a deep humanity, which is admirable. Having this letter from Du Bois in our collection at the National Archives sheds another light on this towering figure we get a glimpse of another side of Du Bois, the activist and organizer. Having this letter in our collection is both unusual and special. The time over to Lucy again, thank you. Thank you very much, Iqbal. Thank you, that's really inspiring. Okay, I'm going to hand over to our final speakers for this evening, um, Kirsten and Sarah, and I'll move on to your slides. Over to you. Just let me know when you want me to move on. Thanks so much. It's very good to be here and to be part of this. Uh, I'm going to kick off and then uh, Sarah's going to take over. I'm going to talk a little bit generally about the Commission for Diversity in Public Realm. 
um, and then Sarah's going to go into a bit more detail on one of our um, one of our projects. So we can go to the first slide, please. Uh, and um, uh, so I think I suppose just in a context perspective, we're uh, obviously looking at this uh, from the perspective of working um, at City Hall for the Mayor of London. Um, we work in the Culture and Creative Industries Unit. Um, and in the course of that, have um, certainly in my work, which is around cultural infrastructure, uh, I have a lot to do with kind of various different aspects of public realm um, and cultural buildings across London. And uh, one of the key projects that happens in my team is the fourth plan um, on Trafalgar Square, which is one of the reasons that's pictured here. Um, but that is also very much the reason that uh, I also got involved in um, the campaign for a statue of the first woman on um, Parliament Square, uh, which then turned out to be Mosin Fawcett in 2018. And, um, and that was really the kind of starting point for this conversation about a commission for diversity in the public realm. I'll talk a little bit more about Millicent in a bit, but just to say that the, the position, the, the, the kind of principle was in 2018, we looked at, you know, why is there this big drama about putting a statue of a woman up in London? And uh, what does that mean for the wider position of how people are represented across the public realm in in London, what can we do about that? So that kind of planted the seed with the mayor about uh, um, how to address that more proactively. And uh, then in June of 2020, he announced the Commission for Diversity in Public Realm, which is the program that we are here to talk about now. So uh, clearly, we know London is a very diverse city and built on and, and all the stronger for that. Um, uh, with these stats, about 40% of people who live in London were bo born elsewhere. Um, but also, obviously, uh, diverse histories are the making of this city and have been, have always been. Um, and we, uh, we think, especially coming from the creative industries and coming from visual arts, that uh, the visual symbols in our public realm are emblematic and tell us a lot about our identity and indeed shape our identity, um, as previous speakers has, have also mentioned. Um, and we need to think about how we're celebrating the achievements of all of our um, of all of the people who contribute to making London the city that it is. So, just to move on to the next slide, please. Um, so this this is a, an example of um, what you know. In a sense, the fourth plinth is a really great example of how you can think about interacting um, with the kind of histor historical um, infrastructure of London. Uh, in different ways and in this uh, the fourth plinth uh, has been empty for 160 years or thereabouts and has become uh, since around 2000 has been a, um, a place of rolling um, temporary artworks which respond to the end the only brief really for this program is to respond to the 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 kind of texture of Trafalgar Square and the history of Trafalgar Square in a way and uh, Yinka Shanibari did this brilliantly in 2010 by looking at um, by kind of replicating Nelson's ship in a bottle, but using, uh, referencing kind of colonial history with the, um, using uh, the Baltic um, design on the flags, um, which was both kind of very playful and also extremely hard hitting really. And that is a lot of what the, the fourth plinth commissions tend to be. Um, and, and that, you know, does, it, it kind of really speaks to the fact that there's an opportunity to engage with history in a different in different ways, including one which positions a contemporary perspective against a historical one and then seeks to kind of clarify what's going on in the middle in a way between those two things. Um, and uh, we'll probably come back to that again as well. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, so the, the commission has been, um, was set out as uh, an open recruitment, uh, nearly 300 people applied to be become part of it. Um, we appointed 14 people. Um, the, the, the kind of um, principle is to, to listen and create a space for conversation about public realm, um, to think about ways that the public realm can actively reflect uh, a wider diversity, um, to collaborate across different institutions, so we've um, set up a partners board, which represents, you know, which has representatives from Historic England, English Heritage, Arts Council England, Art Fund, Museum of London, um, um, Black Cultural Archives, um, and, and many other uh, organizations uh, which contribute uh, to the kind of shaping of the commission agenda. 
Um, and we've kind of embraced a wide definition of what constitutes the visual signifiers of the public realm and the places where hopefully the Commission will have some impact. Uh, and those are listed here, but, um, you know, it's not just about statues, but it is also about statues. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. Um, and then going to the next slide. Um, some of the key areas are understanding what the current public realm looks like. Um, thinking about how to adapt to that, how to change that, how to add to it, um, and also how to consider um, interacting with what already exists, um, particularly in areas that are, um, you know, in a, in a way problematic or maybe not, um, yeah, in, in a, not kind of don't reflect the kind of full historical picture. Um, and then a kind of an engagement program, which really which really widens this debate and brings people into a debate in a positive and, and kind of productive way. There's quite a lot of terminology that's thrown around the place, you know, whether that's a kind of woke agenda or, you know, various different kinds of um, terms used in the media, which uh, we know don't reflect the position of most Londoners, um, but we would like to find a way to actively engage more Londoners in this discussion uh, in a way that's productive. Um, and then uh, policy, practice and legacy, all of that is about embedding this kind of process into the public realm in the long term. So how do we think about what the elements and components of this are um, and how do we shape those changes? Uh, and really, this goes down to working both with institutions, but also with borough, with boroughs in particular, with the kind of planning processes in London um, and how you affect the kind of actual kind of fabric in a way of the of the city for the long term. Um, so next slide, please. Just um, very briefly going to talk about um, this. So, um, you know, very excitingly, Art UK has been for a number of years working on a national audit of, um, um, of sculpture, actually. It's um, it, the definitions of sculpture. So Art UK previously did an audit of painting across public collections across the entire UK. Um, and then they started on this audit of sculpture, and that, of course, includes memorials and um, statues, uh, but it also includes, for example, sculptural mosaics and things like that. Um, and they've looked across, you know, um, everything and documented, they photographed everything and geolocated it as well, uh, all of which is data which is open, uh, which is publicly accessible um, and has just kind of now really started to go public. Um, and, you know, shockingly, this is, these are only kind of a few of the kind of top stats really from that. So a fifth of statues are dedicated to named men, uh, only 4% are dedicated to named women. There are more sculptures which feature animals than there are of named women. Uh, and out of a total of almost 50 sculptures, there are only three dedicated to named women of color. Um, etc. And there's lots more data in the sense where that come and we, we came from and we would like to you know, look at that in a bit more detail also to look at who's doing the commissioning. How do we, who, you know, who's been doing most of the commissioning in recent years? I'm going to say that's probably largely in the private sector. Who's, you know, how do you influence that and, and um, what needs to happen there? So that's kind of one element of the kind of mapping and data collection that's been going on to really set the picture of where we are. But just to, to talk about the, the kind of importance in a way of this, I mean, people might say statues are flippant or artworks in public realm are flippant and maybe not as important as changing other systems. And, and I mean, we would never pretend that this program is anything other than looking at the visual representation um, you know, this is the this is the bit that we that that the commission is kind of taking uh, taking a, a lead on. Um, but you know, we I've heard this twice now in the last uh, in the last couple of weeks. Actually, we went to talk to some of the guides in Westminster who do all of the historical tours and guides around Westminster and have around three hundred members or so. And one of the key things that came out of that session really was that before we put up the statue of Milson Fawcett, um, the tours of Parliament Square did not include um, the, the information about the suffrage movement in the UK. Uh, and now they do. And I think that in itself really tells us everything we need to know about why these things are important. Um, and how, you know, and, and then yesterday, someone told me they did a London bus tour, a big London bus tour around, and they also heard about Milson Fawcett on bus tours. So that, in a sense, is how 
I mean, to me, that's the real currency of what we're doing, which is about uh, is about kind of looking, informing, you know, what's happening visually, what you can see, but also what people are talking about. And it's one of the things about um, why I think, for example, things like street names are important because they're in people's language all the time. They're informing the use of language and therefore they become things that are in people's minds. And so I think that's um, that's really important. I think that level of um, visibility, as Alex already said earlier, is just extremely crucial. Um, and uh, so just to say, yes, yeah, so it's that level of visibility, I think that we wanted to target in the first instance. And with that, I will hand over to Sarah. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, Lucy, next slide, please. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. I am Sarah Dos Santos, um, current program manager for the Commission and Diversity in the Public Realm. And there's going to be some scope to talk about and um, kind of reference other ways that you can get involved. But I'm going to speak to uh, one of our most recently launched projects, um, which is the Untold Stories. Um, and it's a one million pound fund um, that which plays a part in the Commission for Diversity in the Public Realm. And it's one of the mayor's flagship commitments in cementing London as a diverse and global city. Um, the aim for Untold Stories really is to um, engage with community led organisations and invite them to apply for, for, for the grants and um, to develop and um, deliver projects that essentially increase diversity. Um, and that essentially could look at um testing new ideas uh, developing new ideas growing projects uh, creating projects etc um, and that can look at which is highlighted here in these slides as well which could be murals artworks plaques um, benches memorials etc the list is is endless but it's really a real opportunity to come together and as we've spoken about already today um tell a story from a from a different perspective or from a perspective that hasn't yet been fully heard and um, understood. Um, next slide, please. The types of funding that is available um, for anyone who is interested in applying is we have, we've categorized it into two tiers and currently it's, um, or it is in fact, test and nurture, which is up to £5,000, which has been made available to develop a concept, uh, to run a small scale project and to test a new idea. Um, and this could include, but isn't limited to consulting with local people developing ideas alongside artists, arch archivists, um, local historians, heritage groups, etc. It could look at running community workshops um, and jointly developing ideas. It looks at, um, or it could look at um, getting support to secure planning permission, um, as well as testing a new idea. And then our second strand, uh, which is the grow and make it happen strand, which is from 4,000 to 25,000 pounds has been made available um, and that's essentially to develop uh, a kind of an existing idea that has already been tested and it's ready really to take the next stage and again that could look like um, and of, of course not limited to workshops with your kind of local communities um, and that's again to develop artworks you know consultancy uh, building a be better idea of how to um, yeah develop an object or plaques etc um, it could look at you know a new augmented reality um, a guided tour uh, provide uh, further context and insight um, that you know to something that you wanted to draw attention to um, and then lastly it's also to develop and run uh, kind of new or regular um, events within public spaces. So there's lots of scope there uh, and, and we're kind of more than open and willing to hear ideas, which kind of leads on to kind of, we also have uh, funding available for access. Um, so any personal access costs that anyone may need to, you know, to develop or apply for the funding that's been made available in addition to, um, outreach sessions that we have currently um, that are, are open for people to come along and ask questions and find out how they um, can get involved or how to apply or if they're seeking support with kind of applications and um, there's some access costs available for that um, as well. There's a lot of information there, I'm sure, but we're going to be coming back 
to some questions later on. So feel free to do to ask any questions around the grants program um, if, if you need to. There's some links also that will be made available. I can put them in the chat now that you can kind of access more information, whether that's the perspective or, or prospectus, or whether that's uh, finding out about our out outreach sessions or just generally about um, more information about the grants program. Um, next slide, please. Kirsten, I think this is handing back over to you. Let's have a look. Yes, yeah, you know, just some kind of short outlines of engaging Londoners in other ways that you can get involved. Um, Kirsten, I'll hand back over. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, just, yeah, I mean, I think we, we're, we've embarked on a series of roundtables um, uh, for, from kind of various different viewpoints. We, we had talked at one point about the idea of evidence sessions um, for the commission, um, thinking about how we can make presentations in a sense to the commissioners about how, um, you know, about about where uh, where there is a particular reason to kind of um, focus on a particular community or hear from a particular community, for example. Um, we've done some work with Bristol, uh, City of Bristol, who have already also been working on the subject um, and who've recently produced some really, really good guidance, by the way, on um, how for local authorities really on um, engaging with kind of contested sites. Um, I mean, terminology, you know, is that's a that's a kind of classic is is what we as a team have started calling contested sites is is, is what we mean is we say we mean a, um, a figure, um, you know, who represents some element of um, either colonialization or or, or or is a colonizer or has represents some other kind of form of of uh, period i suppose in in the uk's history which is is you know really needs to have more information and more learning distributed about it in some way i mean it's kind of it's such a wide-ranging term but um and it'd be and, and that is one of the things so another round table is in fact going to be about that very subject in a way about how to engage with that but also what terminology are we using and why and you know that kind of thing so I mean, that's one of those things. Um, Bridging History is a program that Bristol started, actually, which is about bringing families and groups into a discussion about their own histories and how that's reflected in food and culture in, in different ways and, um, and to kind of explore that and learn about, um, about your local area, that kind of thing. And, and we've kind of augmented that uh, for London and um, included some a kind of a mini grants program along with that. And then we're walking, we're, we're looking at a season, hopefully, of events, which will come about in spring, which is about getting people out, uh, kind of walking and talking around London um, in different ways. But it really is building on a series of things that already exist, actually, in London. I mean, one of the early things that happened when we launched this program is we immediately got contacted by a taxi driver who said, I'd really like to do this. I want to, you know, I know loads of stuff about London. I want to bring the commissioners around the place. And, you know, so, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that, you know, I, is out there um, in various different ways. And we would really love to bring together um, uh, in a way that kind of really looks at reflecting uh, the wider history of London. Um, yeah, I think that's it on that. And then uh, the next slide is just some links. Um, oh, sorry, no, apologies, I missed this one. <laughs> this is my mental block, <laughs> talking about um, Clive of India. Um, so uh, this, this is uh, this, this, actually, this is the thing I really did want to say here uh, is, um, you know, we've got this Art UK information now, which is kind of where everything, where, where things are in the public realm that exist. And of course, that gives us a lot of information about gaps, but it also it also tells us kind of gives us a lot, I think, about, you know, where where we can direct people to and what, you know, kind of thinking about how people can create their own tours, their own walking tours in a way, their own public collection, which is really what Art UK thought about when they when they started this work um, as they're kind of responsible for public art collections or public collections in, in the UK. But, you know, but where is where, how do you then bring into the public realm in a physical way uh, the full these narratives you know the decolonized text from wikipedia how do you make that something that people can engage with when they're standing in front of a statue when they're kind of confronted with a figure how how can they learn more how can they understand more you know how can they see that there are different kind of layers of this history etc 
Um, how can they even know, for example, how was the statue, how did it even get here in the first place? How was it commissioned? Who commissioned it? Who's responsible? So the REK research brings together a lot of that information um, in terms of the kind of the, the kind of physicality of how a, a sculpture might have come about, but it doesn't necessarily have any texts around the history, the historical significance. So, um, you know, there's a there's a real question that we are trying to grapple with and that we will be bringing the commission into. So how how do you do that? Is it you know, is it is it kind of QR codes? Is it is it something else? Is it you know what? How do you kind of think about that? And and what's best the best way to do it to make that a kind of genuinely accessible thing? Because certainly um, one of the philosophies that we've adopted with the commission is kind of um, uh, determined reasonableness. Um, which is just the continuous reiteration of facts and kind of realities to the point where everybody simply knows them and accepts them for what they are, um, rather than kind of wanting to engage in in kind of screaming arguments. It's it's just kind of constantly rehearsing the reality, which I think is the project that you're also doing, Lucy. And I think you know that is exactly kind of the point, isn't it? It's just just keep going back to it, keep going back to the fact, keep reiterating and plotting and getting other people to do that too. And, um, and I think there's a real opportunity to try and think about how you do that and nip that into the public realm, but I haven't, we haven't quite established how that will happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsten and Sarah. Thank you. And then I think, are you gonna post these links to the chat, did you say? I'll post this in the chat as well, yeah. That would be really helpful. And feel free, um, the rest of the panellists, to post any other links that you think will be useful and related to your talks. Um, thank you, all the panellists there. That was just um, fantastic. Um, and I'm looking forward to having a look at the chat in a moment. Um, just to kind of, like, offer some reflections on what I've just heard there and, and kind of how it meets my sort of hopes for this evening. You know, what I really wanted for us as, a, as an audience, as a group here this evening to know about was, you know, some examples of the kinds of stories and histories that um, relate to the history of the city in which the university is based, that are, that are untold or less known, but to also know where, where, where is the documentation of that? Does it exist? Where does it exist? Can I access it? Can I use it? So thank you so much, Iqbal, for giving an example of something that's sitting there, you know, in, in our own government public archives that, that can, could be accessed and, and used. That's fantastic to know. So it's just an example of that. And the other thing I wanted us to know about this evening was to think about, you know, how, how might we, you know, and not just academics, any member of the public, what kind of power do we have to influence changes in the public sphere so that it is more reflective of our diverse histories and stories and what support is available for that so thank you Kirsten and Sarah for telling us about a very kind of clear and current example of, of a kind of supported initiative that could enable us to to make those changes and Wikipedia is as I said at the start um, an example of public sphere it's kind of as you've just said Kirsten it's an iterative space where you know numerous people can be going in and and editing simultaneously or successively to be updating that information. Um, so, you know, the decolonizing Wikipedia network is just one example of many initiatives that are happening across the world that are trying to support action, you know, and change and to, and to not just be driving it and kind of leading it, but actually to be growing capacity, so which kind of comes back to what you were speaking about, Alex, of kind of small changes and small editorial interventions can be really powerful if there are hundreds of people doing that and and Richard you know hopefully we'll see in 10 years time that kind of heat map of the, the world of where the hot activity of Wikipedia editing is going on how that will hopefully change as that kind of capacity um, grows which I know kind of really speaks to those core principles of Wikimedia UK you were you were talking about so we have time now for discussion. Um, I'm going to start looking at the Q&A and bring those back to the panel. But before um, we look at the audience Q&A that's coming in, um, panellists, did you have any comments or questions that you wanted to ask or offer to the other panellists here this evening now that you've heard each other's presentations? 
Uh, well, there was a suggestion that um, there's something which could answer Kirsten's question, um, QRpedia. So that is basically a way in which people can interact with Wikipedia. So you could in theory have a QR code um, in a particular location, someone scans it and then is directed to a Wikipedia article in the language of their phone. So it's uh, is tailored content. So it's providing it in um, person's um, the language they've chosen and it allows people to bring Wikipedia into the environment around them uh, and bring in that um, the the neutrality that Wikipedia aspires to. So that could be an interesting, an interesting avenue to explore. They are great. Sounds very exciting. Thank you, Richard. Any other comments or questions from the panelists? Well, I noticed there's no statue of W.E. Du Bois in London, as far as I'm aware, or anywhere yet. I think there was one in conversation at one point, but uh, which seems remarkable. Yeah, yeah. And also just just the, um, you know, not people don't really know that, you know, the meeting even happened in Central Hall and, and that there were so many significant figures who had come. And um, so there's, there's lots that still I'm sure to be done. Definitely. Well, thank you. Um, please feel free to keep chipping in. I'm going to have a, just to kind of go at going through some of the questions and comments that are here now. And Richard, you've already spoken to um, a question that came in from Lucy Crompton Reed about the QRpedia. And that was one of the first things that came to my mind about kind of going around the public sphere and how can we interact with a digital interface that's going to give us information. And I kind of it's really good to know a little bit more about that. I'm also thinking walks and talks, you said walks, talks plus wiki edit, you know, kind of because it is something we can do from our phone. It's something we could we can do out there while we're in spaces with other people um, as a kind of co-editing initiative. So that's one question um, address. I'm just going to start back from the top. Um, Rahul, thank you. You've posted um, some comments and questions here. The first of all, um, a reminder that um, University of the Arts London and the Student Union um, Arts Student Union created two zines that are online about decolonizing the arts curriculum. And Rahul, you've done a Google search and nothing's coming up on Wikipedia. So there's a job there for someone in the decolonizing Wikipedia network or anyone else out there that's um, that's watching to create a Wikipedia page um, to acknowledge the existence of these zines. And I'm sure that there's lots of other <laughs> things as well that um, have been products on this topic that, that could do with a Wikipedia page to be added. Thanks for that, Rahul. And let us know if you'd like us to support you to create that page as well, because that's what kind of we're, we're speaking about tonight is how can we all feel empowered to make edits, whether it's big, small or creating new pages. I'm sure the zines would also make good references as well. So that's often a way in which Wikipedia can be improved. So if something um, doesn't have an article yet, you can still include that information elsewhere. Um, so that's a good way of bringing through new voices, especially um, because um, a lot of people active in a particular field might not meet Wikipedia's notability criteria. We can still mention them in different parts of Wikipedia and make sure that they and their work have prominence and actually feed into that whole discussion within their field. Indeed, thank you, Richard. So another comment from Rahul, which um, is for you, Iqbal. Um, one of our colleagues at UAL, Paul Goodwin, co-curated an exhibition in 2019 all about W.E.B. Du Bois called Charting Black Life. So I think he just wanted you to know about that. Hopefully you'd seen it. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, point, and Rahul makes a good point, obviously, in flagging it up, but it's this thing about London and the fact that Du Bois actually was here. And that, I think, brings somebody who's, uh, who's a, a, an immense figure, I mean, hugely towering, influential figure. He had an extraordinary life. He lived, I think, up to, I mean, I stand to be corrected, but possibly till his 90s. He, 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 he saw so much and did so much, and his views changed so significantly over the time. He grew massively. Um, so somebody of that significance coming here, being here, I think for students in 
people here in London and the UK to realize that he's not just an American, but he's also, you know, somebody who is for us here in Britain and for, for Londoners as well. Um, so yeah, that's great, Rahul, to obviously flag that up. But I think there's some effort now we still need to do about, as you're trying to do, Lucy, with, with the others about drawing, you know, London's story and, and the story within these aisles of how the colonies were never ever far away from what was going on here, as we all know. Yeah, definitely. Whether it's in yeah, a Wikipedia edit or a, a street name change or a blue plaque, um, there's kind of numerous ways that um, these, these stories could be marked. Thank you. Um, so we've got, um, well, firstly, a comment and then a question from Victoria Standing. Firstly, to say thank you for everybody for taking the time tonight to share your hugely important work. Um, as a teacher edu educator working in initial teacher education, I'm acutely aware of the extent to which secondary pupils in the UK rely on Wikipedia as a primary source of information. This gives rise to two questions, which would be happy for anyone to answer here tonight. The first question, how do you prioritise which areas to focus upon, given the sheer enorm enormity of the database? Two, um, to what extent are school teachers involved in the network? Is there scope for involving them? That might be something that I can answer at the moment. The only teachers that are involved are the staff at the university because the network um, is very much kind of UAL facing. But I certainly have hopes that we can kind of support work that's happening outside of this university um, and kind of set up or inspire similar models to happen. Um, so that's something we can have kind of further conversations about. I don't know if anyone else want, from the panel wanted to speak to e either of those questions, especially around the sheer enormity of the database. I'm happy to come in a little bit on that. Um, I think the beauty of Wikipedia, um, of editing Wikipedia is in the way that, the, especially like with my experience in the network, is the way people bring their own areas of expertise into the fold. Um, it's not just a case of um, going at it randomly and hoping that you find something good. It's very much about, in my experience, applying the things that you're passionate about. Um, so I think that's always been the best place to start for our members. Um, prioritizing the things that A, you know about and B, you're confident enough about to um, make a meaningful contribution. Um, that's not to say that it's not and there have been really successful edits where people have come at something just by identifying an area in their own research that is lacking on, on Wikipedia and doing very extensive research to completely build a new page. Um, all approaches are good, but certainly I think the place to start is with your own interests and the things that you think you've noticed in your own browsing are missing. Um, and just uh, to add to what Lucy said, I think we're, I hope that we're quite transparent um, on the blog about how we, um, go about the network um, in terms of the way it's structured. So hopefully it wouldn't be too hard to um, take from the way we've done things um, if you are outside of UAL and want to create something similar. Um, and as Lucy alluded to, we're always open to receiving questions and helping people out with that. Thank you, Alex. And just on the note of kind of the way in which you might work with teachers, whether it's school teachers or university lecturers and part of what um, we're doing or what I'm doing alongside the network because the network runs very much kind of as an extracurricular endeavor at the university students and staff can participate you know as they wish outside of their kind of core activities so it shouldn't affect their assessment you know it could be just something that they could do of their own volition um, but I am working with some lecturers to embed it as a kind of in curricular activity um, so that that kind of skills development is kind of it makes the most of some of the skills that the students are learning anyway when they're writing an essay or producing some kind of a research portfolio or something like that that it's kind of then you know a, um, um, a really real world sort of output um, so these these kind of things that we're experimenting with and, and trying at UAL that I'd be happy to speak about with other educators across other sectors to think about how those similar models might work um, elsewhere. I don't know if anyone else wanted to comment on, on that. Or... Well, I think the school curriculum is very important. And obviously, as we know, it's something where there is still a lot of work to do. 
I, I use curriculum in a very sort of, you know, guarded way. Basically, what we teach young people in schools, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think Wikipedia, and it's, 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 it's very nice to hear from a teacher saying that, you know, um, certainly pupils are, are, are using Wikipedia. And so there's a real opportunity there to, um, to make more of that. And I, I mean, it would be great to see other ways in which we can reach out to teachers and get them to work with institutions like ours and others to kind of really work on this thing about um, how do we get pupils to find out those other bits of information that they could then put their hand up in class and say, actually, did you know? <laughs> um, so I think there's some real, you know, grafting to be done, but it's exciting to know that, you know, pupils are using Wikipedia a lot, so that's great. And just to kind of add to that, um, in terms of if there are any ideas that people want to explore, that's exactly what the grants program is there to do, is to offer, you know, space and time and, and, some, and some cash to, to support some of that thinking uh, and, and to allow people to take this idea further um, and test it in, in, in many ways. So for sure, it's a great opportunity to um, apply and, and, and extend this thinking further. That's really good to know, Sarah. Thank you. And yeah, kind of back, coming back to kind of like what, what support is needed. Um, there are, it's good to know there's opportunities there. Um, I'm going to carry on going through questions, kind of maybe steer us in a slightly different direction. Um, um, apologies for this, if I pronounce the name that's on here, Manama. Number two, um, have retyped from the chat a question. How does your mission square up with the WP rules of, and then there's two links here, one to the neutral point of view page of Wikipedia, um, which says that an encyclopedic content on Wikipedia must be written from a neutral point of view. And then there's another link here to the Wikipedia's advocacy page. And that page says that Wikipedia content, let me just get over to it. Advocacy is the use of Wikipedia to promote personal beliefs or agendas at the expense of Wikipedia's core content policies um, and kind of compromising neutral point of view. So thank you so much for that question. I think it's a really important thing to, to raise. And when you talk about mission, I'm assuming that means the mission of um, the decolonizing Wikipedia network and what we're talking about here today. Um, firstly, panelists, did you want to um, come back with any responses on that? Uh, well, I do have some thoughts on this, but I'm going to open it up to other panelists first. Uh, in my experience, I think um, ultimately to uh, add the truth about things that are missing on Wikipedia doesn't um, affect neutrality doesn't advocate for anything other than the full the full facts of a story of history i don't think that is um taking a side per se um he might argue that doing this work in the first place is taking the side of decolonial thought perhaps but um i in i, I think it can only serve the greater good to <laughs> to make sure that as much truth as possible is represented on such a widely accessed um platform uh, yeah, I guess that's my two cents on that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really good point. By adding information to Wikipedia, um, we are helping it actually become more neutral. So the idea of neutrality is one of Wikipedia's key principles. Now, whether neutrality can actually be achieved is a whole other issue. But we've seen that Wikipedia's content contains some significant imbalances. So there's a long way to go before we actually reach that neutrality. Now, what shape that actually is and how we measure neutrality um, is another matter. But we know that there are going to be people we can write into these articles that can be making sure their accomplishments and activities are mentioned in relevant parts of Wikipedia or creating entries about them if um, they meet Wikipedia's uh, notability criteria. So that's something which we can definitely contribute to by making Wikipedia more neutral, by bringing through um, underrepresented people and their works. And that goes through to the references as well, making sure that where appropriate, 
those voices are being um, spotlighted in terms of making sure their work is being used as a source of information for Wikipedia, as well as being foregrounded in the article text. And in terms of, so that's a core policy around Wikipedia's content. And in terms of advocacy, it's kind of a, a corollary around that, basically to make sure that, I mean, some of us will be really passionate about something to do with Wikipedia, uh, whether that's um, an area of work or a social issue or um, a historical issue or contemporary issue. And it's a reminder that we need to make sure that we are sticking to Wikipedia's guidelines around neutrality, that while we might very strongly hold a particular view about something, that is not going to be the only view that's out there. And sometimes that needs to be reflected in Wikipedia articles. Um, so there are, there are two different aspects there. There are some issues where um, we can foreground people by making sure that their work is represented and making sure that um, names and dates are included in Wikipedia articles and we're not accidentally writing people out of those stories. And also where issues are contested in the past or present, we document that contested issue on Wikipedia. And we don't present it as a, uh, a fait accompli saying, this is how it is, or this is how it should be, and try and shape our reality by um, rewriting Wikipedia as we want the world to be. But we certainly can write people into Wikipedia and make sure that we are appropriately addressing these subjects. Thank you, Richard and Alex. And, and I think that that part of what you just said there, Richard, um, is what I, I, I'm increasingly kind of enjoying about um, editing Wikipedia is that, um, is that all of those edits, all of those interventions, sometimes what is a contestation or a balancing of neutrality in various edits is is documented. It's all there and to be seen by the public in the edit history. It's, it's kind of transparent, um, the, the development and iterations of that knowledge production, um, which is sometimes, well, caught too often, not the case in the way other forms of knowledge is presented as, as like you say, a fait accompli, you know, that this is it, this is the truth, this is the gospel or the canon. Um, but, you know, what, that's kind of what um, I'm trying to promote, the, that, that aspect of Wikipedia editing about. So thank you. Yeah, go ahead. If I may, one final thought on that particular aspect is that Wikipedia is an iterative process and a collaborative. So we're not trying to get it perfect on the first attempt. Um, if there's an issue with an edit, it can be discussed. We can actually work on the wording. So it's all about, in that situation, engaging with the other community of Wikipedia writers and discussing the content of the article. Exactly, thank you. Um, I'm going to go on to the last two comments that have come in and feel free if you do want to post anything more from T Finnegan. Thank you. You've asked, have you thought about partnering up with other HE institutions in other parts of the world? Um, if that's a question for me, then yes. <laughs> and we've already been approached and started to form some connections. Um, as I said, the Decolonising Wikipedia Network isn't unique. There are kind of numerous initiatives um, across the world that are set about, you know, empowering and inspiring people and equipping people with the skills to edit Wikipedia for issues of kind of social justice and, and you know, rebalancing um, narratives, etc. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of power to be had in, in joining forces and supporting each other. Um, for this particular project, as we're talking about London's colonial history, um, as mentioned in previous, by previous speakers, um, what's interesting and unique about London is that it, it is the kind of melting pot for all the, you know, the, the form of known as dominions or colonies and people that have migrated um, from across the world. Um, and those kind of connections are still still there. So I'm kind of trying to explore at the moment some possibilities to work with community groups um, or institutions, academics, um, whoever has the passion, as Alex said, you know, the passion and the interest and the knowledge um, to think about how we can reflect on um, 
Britain's colonial history, um, but in relationship to, you know, the, the legacy on communities in those former colonies or dominions. Um, what is the story that's told there? What is the story that's told here? How do they relate? And how can those Wikipedia pages be enhanced through that kind of collaboration? So that is definitely something that I'm exploring at the moment. I don't know if anyone else wants to speak anything more about kind of that international collaboration element. Like, I don't know, Sarah and Kirsten, if there's a kind of element to do with that, because I know your commission is very much to do with London's history, but is there kind of that sort of international outward facing aspect yeah. of it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the one of the first things we did actually was we have a network of um, cities called the World Cities Culture Forum, which was initiated by London in 2012. And it brings together kind of city officials or people who work in cities across different about 40 something, 44, I think, different um, cities. So uh, we, we went out to some of those cities, actually, and we've been having ongoing conversations with them about how they're dealing with exactly the same um, the same issues and the same um, processes. Uh, we've had a very kind of rewarding and rich conversation, particularly with New York and some of the things that have been going on there. Um, the upshot is everyone else has more money to put into this than we do. But, but some people have been doing it a lot longer, but there's a lot to learn uh, and share there, definitely. And, and also more locally with Bristol, you know, we've already had um, a lot of conversation as well. I'm going to have to drop off now, though. I hope that's all right. That's fine. I'm going to just get your message. Thank you, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks for offering that further insight into the development of the commission and, and your international network. Um, there's obviously so much more that we could be talking about. I'm just going to kind of draw attention to the final um, comment that's coming from audience member Kate Trant. Thank you, Kate. You've said that in case we haven't come across it, there is an organisation called Facing History, which works to create classroom resources, UK and US, for teaching secondary school children about issues around decolonisation. Thank you, Kate. That's really useful to know about. Um, I'm sure there are other examples as well. Feel free to share if you know of others that are similar. Um, so I'm just going to kind of draw back to the main um, slides. We've kind of had a little talk about that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much all of today, today's speakers and panellists for offering us kind of insights for this launch event on how we can kind of approach Wikipedia um, in this way through the lens of decolonization and anti-racism and how we might edit Wikipedia or think about editing Wikipedia or creating new Wikipedia pages that can kind of help people to understand better the, the role that London played during the British colonial period and the legacy of that today and its kind of physical and virtual sort of traces. So thank you so much, um, all of our speakers this evening for kind of speaking to the various aspects um, of this for the, the launch of this project. Um, just a reminder that the YouTube video for this evening's event will hopefully be on, yeah, online um, soon. Um, I, I expect in a, in a week or so once the subtitles are added and that we'll be having, I'll be hosting another event on the 8th of February, which will be continuing this discussion and have some other exciting external speakers and members of the decolonizing Wikipedia sharing their experiences and on the 10th of May um, a reflection event. Also to um, say that yeah we have a, a website for the decolonizing Wikipedia network I'll pop that link into the chat um, and you can find out a little bit more information about our kind of aims and activities there. Um, yeah, thank you very much. It's been fantastic um, hosting this event and I'm really grateful for everybody's input. Well, thank you for inviting us along and most importantly, thank you for leading the initiative. Um, it's things like this which do make the internet a better place. Cheers. Thank you all. Thanks all.